Well, the topic on Monday special tonight is crime. We are asking whether you feel safe uh, wherever you are in this country and just how do we bring uh, the crime trends down in this country. Janet Bog, of course, is in our talk studio with a panel. And we now cross over to her. And of course, before that, she's going to take us through some startling statistics. Janet. Right. Thank you so much for that, Hussein. Yes, I'm going to introduce um, my panel now. Right next to me, we have uh, Philip Ndolo, of course, is the uh, Director of Operations. Uh, and he'll be telling us more about what the police are doing really to curb this growing surge, a crime wave that we're talking about here tonight. Right next to him we have Tuta Richard. He's a security expert and analyst. He'll be giving us an overview of perhaps some of the ways we can deal with crime now that it's becoming a lot more sophisticated than it's been in the past. And then we have Thomas Talamoy Erupe. Thomas is a victim of crime. He's actually recovering from the injuries that he sustained about a month ago. He'll be telling us exactly what happened to him. We'll be engaging them in just a few moments. Um, let's see if we have some of your feedback so far. Do we have that? Let's see if we can bring up some of the tweets that a lot of you have been sending us in the last one hour or so. All right, let's take a look at that feedback before we look at the SMSs later on. Uh, David Aoka says, something really needs to be done. Safety is paramount for survival. And then we have at Danny7 underscore MUFC. I had hopes in the vetting process of our police department. Affirmative action is what we want. And then we have a Duncan Mushiri who says the level of insecurity today in Nairobi is only comparable to the period before 2003. Kenyans want action and reassurance. Do we have any more? We have at Amazing Kisumu who says we have thugs on motorcycles robbing people at gunpoint in broad daylight. Um, it is a dire situation. I think I saw that tweet earlier. He was talking about Kisumu. He didn't say where. At Khamis. Uh, Nine Hughes says, burglary is on the rise in our residential areas, insecurity around the country is too high, and the police are not doing anything. Those are his views. Well, we'll be talking to the police in just a moment. Remember to use the hashtag MondaySpecialKE to engage us on Twitter or SMS us on 22422. Again, moments uh, before I engage my panel. This is a look at the crime situation in just the last week alone. On the 17th of March, suspected gangster, a suspected gangster was killed in Changa. We went still on the same day in Umoja Estate in Nairobi. Um, we had that police arrested a man after eight uh, cars believed to be stolen were found in his compound. Let's follow what's on your screens. Uh, 23rd of March 2014, Nyeri Bar attack. Um, and then let's move on to the 20th of March. We have gang kills house help in children's presence. And uh, on the 19th of March, three bodies were found in Narok County on the 19th, triggering fears that there was a gang of executing people and dumping them in the region. That's according to the research that we have. On the 18th of March, the deputy president spokesman was carjacked. Um, that actually happened not too far away from these offices and of course 173 kgs of TNT explosives found in Mombasa. And uh, do we have anything else? I believe that's what we have. 17th of March, yes, a suspected gangster killed in Changamwe. And then um, eight stolen cars located in Umoja. That's just in the last week alone. We seem to have a serious problem. and. It's important that we, you know, talk to the police about this. Some people might say it's cliche. They might say the same thing over and over again. But let me ask you, Mr. Ndolo, what is the problem? Why are we seeing incidents of crime on the rise? Janet, before I, I go on replying that question, allow me first and foremost to send my condolences to the families of the bereaved families and to wish those who were attacked a quick recovery. And having said that, let me come to your point of crime. What I want to say is crime in, in the whole of a country is not as high as people feel. This is because going by the last crime figures that we gave in December, uh, it was evident that uh, cases of crime had dropped by 5,900 cases. And considering the present situation, January uh, 2014, February 2014, comparable figures with January 2011, uh, 2013, mm -hmm. January, February, February 2013, the, again we are seeing a decline in uh, uh, 
in crimes with 506 cases. Okay. So there's a decline. So still comparing January, February mm -hmm. 2013 and January, February 2014, it is low by 600 cases, All right, meaning, well, meaning police is doing much better than it used to do. While we appreciate that, yes. and it's important to, to, to appreciate that it's declining, it's not consoling the hundreds of people who've been talking to us um, over the last week, who we've been communicating to, who still feel unsafe, unsafe in their homes, unsafe in bus stations. The same things that we address over and over again that don't seem um, to be going anywhere, the cases don't seem to be solved. How can you put at ease the feelings of Kenyans right now watching who still feel that they are not safe, despite the fact that you're saying the cases um, are a lot less? Uh, Janet, we are at the top of the things as a police service, and I, was sure to assure the, I want to assure the public that we are doing everything to make that uh, sure that crime goes down to that level it was those days. Okay. Because we'll we cannot be able to eradicate it completely. We'll come back to some but of the ways that security, we can fight it shortly. Security, Janet, starts with you and me. And we'll find out, we'll talk a little bit about Thank that. Thank you very much. Thomas, I'd like to get your story. You went through a harrowing experience. Tell us what happened. <sighs> okay. Thank you for inviting me here so that I can, mm. I can give out my story. Uh, that may be able to help somebody outside there. Okay, I was going to, I was visiting a friend in Kao and then here in Nairobi. Um, we had a good evening. We spent the evening well until morning when I was now going back to my place. Actually, I was going to town so that I connect to my place and come back to job. Now, I it was around 5 in the morning. I asked my, the company of my friend whom I visited. Then we went up to the stage. Kao and Dani, I think you all know that place. We, okay, there was a matatu there. Okay, I quickly went into the, entered the matatu and we left. Uh, there were three people in the matatu and the driver. Uh, later, did I realize that the people that who were in the matatu were the people who later attacked me. Okay, okay, indirectly. Mm. We went on past uh, Gidurai, around 200 or 300 meters from Gidurai stage. That's wh where I was forced out of that matatu. Okay, the, the matatu stopped and then the people whom we were seated there back forced me out, mm. literally. Then I, okay, I was forced down, and then the matatu left immediately. But within 30 seconds, uh, four people came from nowhere. I just, I saw people, two people in my front and others. When I tried to look back, okay, in no time, mm -hmm. they just attacked me. They did not even ask me of, of anything, mm. okay. Those ones who were coming from behind, they started beating me. Then I was, I tried to, to surrender, but there was more beating. Mm. That's when I tried also to resist and to do something to, to, to save myself. So they beat you repeatedly? Yeah, several. They were using uh, metal rods. They actually, they were beating me, the, mm. the, he uh, the head region. Mm. I was, uh, this, 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 uh, this jaw, mm. it was broken like i can say that mm -hmm. um they, they oh, actually they okay. i was beaten all over and those are the pictures yeah. so you were beaten you were bleeding yeah i was bleeding from the ears mm -hmm. and okay they beat me until i was unconscious they took uh, the little money i had my phones i had two phones there they took mm -hmm. and they removed my shirt and shoes and then they left me lying down there. Mm. I was unconscious and okay, I slept there until around um, eight or nine, okay. between eight and nine in the morning, okay. I'm sure. Uh, that's when some people who were passing uh, just picked me up there and they took me to Kawa, Kawa Barracks. Okay. Uh, and there is that, that was you recovering yeah. in hospital. Yes. Did, and um, were they masked or could you see their faces? I could see their faces. Okay. Yeah, but I 
cannot, it was dark, I cannot mm. recall exactly. Did you report to the police? Yeah. You did? Yeah. What's been done since then? Nothing. What did they tell you there? W did they say what they were going to do? That's, they're uh, investigating. Okay. That's what they're telling me. But you haven't gotten any feedback yet? Yeah, no feedback. Then I was taken to a uh, certain hospital there in Gidurai, Kawa. Uh, I mean, Gidurai mm -hmm. Hospital. Okay. Is when I re recovered, I, mm -hmm. I was asked to give a number of somebody I know mm -hmm. who can assist me. Okay. Yeah, I gave a number of a friend. Yeah. Who also called my okay. people. Then they right. picked me up. And your injuries are so bad, you tell me that uh, right now you can't have any solid foods. Yeah, I ca I'm not supposed to eat anything solid for around eight weeks. Okay. It's from the day of surgery. All right. I'm yeah. very sorry to hear that. Um, Tuta, I think we can bring you in at this point. Yes. Like we say, this is a discussion that has been had so many times. We have guests, not just here, other places, talk about crime and how to address it. The concern now is the personal feeling that people, they're feeling personally attacked, personally victimized. It's in their homes, it's in broad daylight. Is there, from your own experience as a, as a security analyst, is there a worrying trend that we need to be looking at right now beyond what we've been analyzing and talking about all the time? Uh, Janet, in any part of the world, mm. uh, when you see an influx, be it of 1%, be it of 2%, be it of any figure, provided there is an influx, then that is an indication that our entire, our entire deterrence systems, either it's dying, it's dead, or it's moribund. Mm. It's just like what happens in the animal kingdom. Okay. That when monkeys realizes that what you have been having in your garden is just a scarecrow, mm. imagine what will happen to your maze. So you're saying it's either moribund. So what's the situation in Kenya from your own views, your own analysis? Which is it? I, I will say we are not, uh, our, our deterrent systems are not dead, but they are dying. They are dying. So what we should do is to recharge those batteries of deterrence. How? Uh, recharging the batteries of deterrence depends with two things. How are we going to deny the criminals uh, the benefits of their action? That is more about the defense. That is more about erecting walls mm. within our homes. That is more about enhancing the security mm -hmm. within our own jurisdictions. The second aspect is how are we going to enhance and to charge our batteries of punishment? Because deterrence is two-way, either by denial or by punishment. Mm -hmm. By punishment is how we react. Mm. Do you think there's a laxity in, the, in terms of how we punish these criminals? Yes. And you can step in, Mr. Ndolo, because the other issue is they, uh, they get away scot-free. There is no follow-up. There's investigations launched, and then they kind of fizzle out. So just between the two of you, that may laxity in punishment. Yeah. May maybe you can allow me to say this, that uh, criminals, just like any other, someone in business, they are uh, rational thinkers they will do a cost-benefit analysis of their actions. Okay. They will ask themselves, suppose I'm caught, what are the costs that I'm going to invest into this process? Mm. If he realizes that the costs is much lower than the benefit, then he will act. And that's what you think is happening? Yes, that is what is happening. Do you agree? I generally quite agree because when you look at issues where you arrest a robber here, tomorrow because of our laws, that uh, robbery is bailable, mm. he's out of court because he has been bailed. He's out uh, on bond. Then uh, this period will be out of bond before he goes to, to court again. Mm -hmm. He will take advantage of the situation. He requires money to hire a lawyer. He requires money to do other, other businesses. Mm. And he must live. He okay. must survive. So that way, you just go turn back again, go rob two other people, before he's go back, he goes back to answer for the charges. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that way he, he managed to live. Yeah. But if he was there and we know he has been robbing, he is in there until mm -hmm. the case is over, then you would see a reduction in the way things are being, being done. But we have so many outside there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they are expect to go, to go back to go and answer for the bonds that they are because they are out, out, out of court. Mm -hmm. And they take that advantage and it can mess us sometime. Uh, Thomas, did, were there people around you when your incident happened? Were there other passers-by and people walking around who saw what was happening to you? Okay, there were no people, mm -hmm. but there were cars passing by. They didn't because, stop? Yeah, they didn't stop. Mm -hmm. Actually, 
b shortly before when when the the people in the matatu were were forcing me out of the matatu mm. there was even a, a police car that just passed on but maybe it didn't understand what, what was, was happening. happening yeah but mm. there was a police car that was passing on what do you make of that tutor because i think a lot of people even from just the views i'm getting are we need to be our own <laughs> safe keepers but then they complain people just kind of you know wind up their windows drive off what do you make of that uh, the reason as to why most of the people will do that because they don't want to carry the baggage mm. of the day they don't want also to be asked so many questions by the officers of what happened and, and you know mm. the process of every time going to court how tedious it is mm. to be a witness and all that okay at the same time stopping also has got its own risk you don't know if you can be the other target mm. you don't even know who are these other people who forms part of that crowd? Okay. So sometimes somebody will say, okay, fine. For my own security, let me speed off and go. All right. Yes. We're going to come back after the break and really focus on solutions. Because again, we're looking at people in their homes, people in crowded places. And like we mentioned before, a lot of these criminals becoming very bold, doing it in broad daylight. How can we ensure our own safety with things like community policing, which we'll talk about very shortly remember you can keep your views coming in double two four double two we'll have some of your sms's shortly and also using the hashtag monday special ke we'll be back shortly Welcome back to Monday Special. We're talking about crime tonight. We'll cross over to Janet Bogwan, the panelist, in a short while. Right now, though, I'm joined by forensic psychologist Dr. Oscar Gidua. Thank you very much for making time for us. He's also an assistant professor of psychology at USIU and a consultant on security matters. Uh, first of all, do you agree that there's been a rise in crime trends in the country? Um, I really do, uh, Hussein. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. I think that I would like to uh, agree with the gentleman from the police service that mm -hmm. while the numbers might have decreased yep. numerically, sometimes we don't look at statistics the way we're supposed to. Violent crime has increased, and that is what should be worrying. Mm -hmm. uh, the general trend might have been decreasing, but mm -hmm. the violent crime that we're talking about, the carjackings, the muggings, mm -hmm. that's what has increased. Mm -hmm. And I do agree that that has gone up. They've talked about the reasons, about the economy being bad. and. And people resorting to crime because I like what the gentleman said, the yeah. cost-benefit analysis, yeah. that it's cheaper to do crime. Um, what are the consequences? But I also want to tell people that I think it's a big issue. The whole system, the whole judicial system, the forensic system, essentially, if the police arrest someone and then they can go to court and be released on bail, Mm -hmm. Guess what's happened to law enforcement? There's a lot of demotivation as well. Yeah. So I think that it's a whole, it's a bigger issue than just the police. Okay. And we also need to remember that it's a big chain. It's almost like a processing chain for yeah. the criminals yeah. that we have to think you about. You talk about uh, them being violent now. Absolutely. It means they're being bolder. Mm -hmm. The trends may not be going high, but you're seeing trends in rise in times of violent crimes. Bolder, bolder. Why, Why uh, would you say that? Look, the economy is bad. Uh, and everyone wants to get ahead. Uh, everyone wants to get... You know, I want to be like you, and you want mm -hmm. to be like me as well. If you remember the story of a guy called uh, Popat, the businessman who had been kidnapped, his kidnappers were university graduates. And as a matter of fact, we've talked and heard about a lot of people who are uh, hijacked or kidnapped by people who are fluent in English, talk very well. So I don't think that the profile of who we call a criminal is what it used to be necessarily. But because our economy is not that good and people are suffering and they're frustrated. The other thing I want you to think about is yeah. mob justice. I don't know, I've not heard about it in a while. Yeah. But what makes a Kenyan walking on the street on a normal day turn into this violent guy who can beat someone to death? That's a question we need to address as a country, yeah. that people have a lot of pent-up frustrations. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to try and tell us the typical profile of a criminal. Yes. So you're talking about... Uh, economic strife yes that the economy of this country is not very good and mm -hmm. that that could be that could be a reason it could but be. is it the only reason no I, of course not i, I think also <laughs> because remember th it's it's bad for all of us but i don't believe that yeah. saying you've become a criminal because the the, the economy is bad but yeah. it's one of those things that contributes dearly for people on the breaking point mm -hmm. you come back you have five children you have all these things people are asking you how can you provide as the man in the family people say what is the cost if i actually decided to go into crime Am I going to be apprehended? And if I'm apprehended, can I bail myself out? So formally or informally? 
It's a cost-benefit analysis, absolutely. just like uh, uh, the expert there said to yes, Janet. absolutely. What you mean, therefore, is that they think they can get away with this and they'd rather go into this? No, uh, not only do they think they can, they know they can. And that's a problem. I think our penal system and also how we apprehend people and how we punish them needs to be looked at again. Mm -hmm. I think that criminals now are operating with impunity because they're not getting the the punishments that they deserve mm -hmm. for the crimes that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that this country punishes people who do robbery with violence with the death penalty and such th things like those, but I don't think that we're actually doing enough to actually arrest them and actually keep them in detention long enough to be punished. Mm -hmm. uh, you, th you are a forensic expert, of course. Yes. Uh, tell me about uh, investigations, I mean, forensic investigations in this country. Where mm -hmm. are we? of technology? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, of course, I'm a forensic psychologist. Psychologist, so it's kind of yeah, different. Yeah. But th the truth is that we have to talk about the whole chain from evidence. Mm -hmm. How are we keeping our evidence? Are our police equipped enough to actually even keep evidence? Uh, during the vetting process, I saw a very dismal video. I, I really felt bad to see what evidence rooms look like in this country. Mm -hmm. If you think that we have to solve crimes, we have to improve how the police are operating in this country. Mm -hmm. And that is a true frustration the country has to see. Mm -hmm. So while we are busy blaming the police, we also need to equip them yeah. and think about what true law enforcement we want. Mm -hmm. Do we want a guy carrying a gun who's frustrated? Mm -hmm. And that's a real, real question. Right. Okay. Typical profile of a criminal, now to where you are, <laughs> forensic psychologist. Yes, yes, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, um, of course, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind mm -hmm. of question, Hussein. But I want to say, first of all, most likely or not, it's going to be a male. <laughs> That's okay. bad news. Uh, someone who's under 30. But I also want to tell people that who is more likely to attack a male is someone who's a stranger, who's more likely to attack a female, someone she knows. And that is what is really weird about the way crime and violent crime especially is looked at. A woman would have been stalked for a long time, someone would have thought about, you know, this is a person I want to attack. If you think about crimes like rape, for instance, someone has been trailing their target for a while. Sometimes it might be opportunistic, but that's something to think about. Talking about people who have low impulsivity, the, mm -hmm. or rather high impulsivity, rather, sorry. And they also have anger issues, also low family support, low social support. Mm -hmm. These are kind of the things that we are looking at that contribute to who might end up being a criminal. Mm -hmm. So because I'm saying that if someone comes from a poor area, it won't turn them automatically into a, 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 a thief or someone who's violent. However, if they have all these other things going on, and especially I want to mention delinquent peers, mm -hmm. that's also another thing. People hanging out in the neighborhood and saying, hey, you know what, I want to drive that Range Rover, but the, the easiest way for me to do it is if I jack the guy in the corner. Mm -hmm. And I know I've used that very colloquial term, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's a reality of what's going on. People under 30 are the ones who are doing that. Unemployment in this country for the youth is really rampant, and I mm -hmm. think we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. The answer to that, reducing it, some of these profiles are created by situations as well. Okay. So if these guys don't have jobs, guess what? Cost-benefit analysis is kind of like a, yeah. a revolving thing. Cycle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what can you do then to protect yourself as a person, you know? Well, I, I, I think one of the things I've been telling people around the country, even with the people that I work I, uh, with, I say that I think that we have true initiatives uh, as a country mm -hmm. to pursue. Things like community policing, for instance. We need to be our brother's keeper. I know that as a country we're moving to be more individualistic. Mm -hmm. And while we might lie to ourselves that Kenya is, more, is a communal country, yeah. we really are not. And we, na we now need to start looking at those suspicious movements in our neighborhoods. Who's, who doesn't belong there? Not in that kind of a way, but in a, in a suspicious way. Who looks like they, they're doing something fishy? Report it. You know, it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we know that criminals will have been stalking their target for a long time before they strike. Mm -hmm. And that's why the question, why that house and not the others? Mm -hmm. They study your patterns. They know that Hussein comes home at 11, such a time. Yeah. time. Everybody else is not there. So they know that, you know, if I go to the gate and wait about 11.15, I'm going to get him. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing. We have to be our brother's keepers. Mm -hmm. And I think as a country, we have to take that very seriously, even before thinking about how the police will help us. Right. We have to help ourselves. Right. Dr. Oscar Gidu, of course, forensic psychologist, you're still going to be with us, of yes, course. Thank you. I'm now going to cross over to Janet. I'm sure there is a reaction, especially from the Director of Police Operations. Janet. Your reactions, Mr. Ndolo, to that? Uh, well, what I want to say is that I quite agree with the experts that um, uh, we're supposed to be our brother's keepers, but uh, over and above that, what I want to insist on is um, we have people are used to certain routines and that routines encourage certain certain crimes to be to, 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 to occur. Mm -hmm. For example, if you are that person who drinks in bar every other day and mm -hmm. go home at midnight, 
Okay. And there are chances that people will waylay you because they know your routine. Okay. Avoid that. Go sometimes early, sometimes mm -hmm. go much later than that. Okay. Yes. I want to interrupt you because we're going to come Please. to that later. Where does the police department need the most help? Is it staffing? Is it funds? Where do you need the most help? Both. Mm -hmm. Both because uh, one cannot do without the other one. Mm -hmm. If it is staffing, we require staffing which must get some funding for it to be there. And are you saying so that there's an issue with that? Is there, are you, are you, do you feel like um, you don't have enough of both? Uh, Janet, look at it this way. Currently, we are running a recruit program which is running for 15 months. And initially, we used to run programs that were running eight, nine months. So by now, we are supposed to, cannot be, uh, do capacity building in a very short time. Uh, so that we, we, we go to the standards that are required, the ratio of four to 450 to one police officer, because we are, our building capacity will take some time. If we recruit uh, 10,000 officers per, in 15 months, when will you build capacity? It will take some time. So it, will, it will boils back to us that we require to do something, that we shorten the training program, but we achieve what really is supposed to be achieved okay. in that short time, then, then we'll be able to build capacity very short Before Richard Tutor short steps in, do you yes. feel that that's really affecting how the police are dealing with crime in the country? Is it a big component? It, it is to a certain extent, but also funding must be there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think what is required today mm -hmm. of our police force is what is equivalent to uh, revolution in military affairs in the army. Mm. What we require is not the number, to increase the number of, mm. the, of, of, of the police officers, because you can still have a lean and lethal police force. It's not about the numbers. So where has it worked? Lean and lethal, where have you seen that It work? has worked. It has worked in America. It has worked in Israel. Okay. What we require, Janet, currently is, first of all, to reconsider modernizing our police force. Mm -hmm. In fact, sometimes I do get irritated when I hear of people talking of reforming the police force. We don't require, you cannot reform uh, an institution that monopolizes instruments of violence. Mm -hmm. What you do, you modernize it. And in modernizing the police force, it is a package. Mm -hmm. What he has said is part of that component. Mm -hmm. It also comes with okay. how they conduct their affairs, mm -hmm. how they are structured, equipments and weapons and the technology. Okay. Thomas, I want to bring you in just now, but let me bring in Mr. Ndolo. A lot of people are saying the word investigation has become so cliche. They're literally sick of hearing about it. People are caught, then they're released due to lack of evidence. Uh, we, you know, with all due respect, the police have um, succeeded in, in some respects. But generally, there's that issue of capturing, releasing due to lack of evidence. And so how then can people feel secure knowing that their case is going to be looked at all the way through, including Thomas's. Uh, Janet, what I want to say is, like Tato has said here, we have Kenyans who don't want to, to assist as such. Assist in the sense that if I have seen somebody has been uh, kajaked or has been injured by robbers, it is a I'm supposed, supposed to take it uh, on my own self to go take that person to hospital if it is a, there is a nearest hospital and make sure that I go to the police record a statement and be ready to go to court as many times as it, is, as it will make that case succeed in court. But we have this case where uh, you saw something, you reported to the police, the police tell you come and record a statement, you don't want to go and record a statement and you want him to carry an investigation and you are the key witness, eyewitness that I saw this gentleman being done, the, uh, this having been done to this gentleman. Can I go deep? How do you assist? Okay. The police will only do show the jury because you don't assist that police as such. Mm -hmm. Because if your evidence was there and somebody else's evidence, then we would be able to convict this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the chances are quite high that you, you'll be convicted. I want to go deeper into something and rope Thomas yes. in because he mentioned it. People feeling that police are actually the perpetrators now. A lot of them saying, how can we trust in the police? If they, a lot of them are the ones <coughs> carrying out these crimes. If a lot of them are colluding with gangsters, to carry out these crimes. A lot of people have said that. He mentioned a police vehicle driving past him. He said it may not have seen him, but still, a very key concern. Are you looking into that? Is that something that has come to your attention? Janet, that is something we are looking to, and we have dealt with those officers who feel they have been uh, colluding with, uh, with, with, uh, with the robbers. Uh, we have seen certain dismissals. We have several cases in court where uh, our officers, our own officers have been caught abating crime in any in any way mm. so that has been done okay yeah thomas do you still feel like you can trust the police 
after what happened to you after going to report to them? Do you have confidence in them? Okay, I cannot say that I don't trust police. Yeah. Well, but uh, the problem is uh, police, I don't think it's about numbers. Police are everywhere we go. You can see them everywhere along your way. But crime happens everywhere they are. I think what is, uh, they forget, at times they forget what the primary uh, duty they're supposed to do. I think police should be uh, informed every day that uh, their primary role is to, to, to take care and protect mm -hmm. people and their properties. That is what they are paid to do. Okay. Not just, I think police, uh, I don't know if they fear robbers or, or what. But they don't Some, act, you're saying sometimes that Sometimes they can see somebody uh, being robbed and they can just continue with it. Yeah. You want to step in? I, I, I think it is very important from the police perspective to tell the public that in any, par in any part of the world there is nothing like absolute security. You cannot guarantee the public's 100% security. Because some of even the measures that you take to provide security mm. themselves are a threat to that security. In what sense? Give me an example. For instance, there are risks involved. Even when the police is use, using his gun to protect a civilian, okay. there are likelihood of even the civilian himself can be shot. So what the police needs to do is to tell the public that we cannot guarantee you 100% guarantee you security. So that even the public themselves can start becoming cautious. Okay. Can I ask you yeah, about... And that is why I'm saying security starts with me and you. Tell me about community policing. For those yes. who don't understand, define it very quickly and then we can talk about whether or not it's working because again, a lot of feedback saying community policing is something that... Co community policing is partnering with the public in fighting crime. Mm. That is the simplest thing. Mm. That the public itself doesn't look at the police per se to fight crime but they in their own way come up strongly to support the police by giving information, by working with the police to partner so that they fight crime together, uh, mm -hmm. so that they, we get a, a, a free crime environment, which again we say you cannot get 100%, but mm -hmm. you minimize to a certain level. Is community policing viable? It is viable, but it depends with the method and how it is applied. Because if we still want to carry com community policing the way it used to be done in the 90s, it cannot work. Mm -hmm. If we st want to force people to come together, it cannot work. The approach is what, what is wanting. Is the approach in Kenya is wanting, yes, that's what you're saying. Wanting. You want to add something before we... Yeah. No, some, just something you had mentioned about, uh, okay, I think police should not sleep on job. I uh, saying citizens should start taking care of themselves first. We are already taking care of ourselves. Who doesn't take care of him or herself? Everywhere we go, everybody, I'm very sure, takes care of himself. But maybe the measures, but we take care wherever we go. That should not be uh, an excuse from police uh, force okay. to sleep on the job. To sleep on the job. All right. Let's uh, cross over to Hussein Mohammed before we come back uh, for the final part of our discussion. Hussein. Dr. Sagidu has something to say, but before that, when we come back uh, to your panel later, I'll just like the police to clarify one issue. We may go on and on in this country criticizing the police, uh, but we also know they have problems in terms of um, how much they are equipped to deal with crime. He says there are problems. Can maybe he tell us, is he in the right place to tell us where are we in terms of reforms and what they are doing to ensure that they get what they need to fight crime? Uh, now we'll come later, of course, to respond to that. But Dr. Oscar Gidu has something to say uh, when somebody has been robbed or somebody has yes. been involved in a crime, a victim, yes. what should they do? Uh, first of all, my, my heart goes out to Thomas. And, um, and, and I really want to tell Thomas, and I'm not in the same studio with him, but that was a really horrific experience and traumatizing, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell Kenyans that if you happen to be a victim of, of crime, the first thing you need to do is seek medical attention. Uh, you see, he, he said that he had been hit was unconscious for a while. Yeah. This has repercussions to someone's brain and functioning and all that stuff. For women who've been raped, it's tough. But go first of all for medical attention because it's important to also get post, uh, prophylactic treatments uh, to prevent you from getting infections like probably mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. HIV. And then when you're ready, 
talk to a mental health care specialist, someone like a psychologist or a counselor, someone who can talk to you and, and, you know, and, and deal with the emotional aspects because this person is going to be going through a lot of loss, yeah. emotional turmoil and trauma, and your life might not look like it's the same anymore. And you see, for us, the topic might just be something we just talk about. Yeah. Thomas is living it right now and many other Kenyans who mm. have been attacked by this crime. So for us, it's not just about uh, statistics, but it's about how do we care for Kenyans who've yeah. gone through it. Yeah. And I also want to tell the communities, if someone has gone through it, just be there for them. Be there for them. Their world has been turned around. And don't be telling them, be strong. That's one thing we tell mm. each other as Kenyans, yeah. be strong. Yeah. But how do, you be, how do you become strong? After you've watched your family member be mm. brutally assaulted, mm. just be there for them care for them like that and we'll support each other that okay. way and I hope that we can get some help for Thomas as well. Okay. It's pretty soon in his, yeah. in his uh, recovery. Uh, right. Yeah. right, okay. Thank Dr. You. Oscar Gidua is a forensic psychologist and also an assistant professor of psychology at the USIU, also a consultant on security matters. Thank you very much for making uh, time for us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Right. We'll cross over back to Janet uh, in a short while. And welcome back to the final part of Monday special. Uh, final comments from our panelists. Uh, very briefly, first your reactions to that story that Michael J Jenga did. Again, the usual hotspots come up again and again. Kisarian, Ong uh, Ongata Rongai. Why is that the case? And you're saying especially new people to that area. Janet, what I would like to say as far as this one is concerned is um, uh, those people are going to those places before they go and purchase land they are supposed to have done a research on the environment. Scan the environment, see wh where you are going to. Because you may go to a place where people are not used to or where crime is so, is so high, but people will not tell you. Because you want a piece of land to buy mm -hmm. and settle, you just go and buy. The next day you can't settle there. And then you migrate to another place. That will be very costly. Scan the environment before you start business. Mm -hmm. Number two, we have followed almost three cases where we have electrical uh, fences and we realize anytime there is a, there is a robbery the, 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 electric is, uh, electric, the power is not on so people just gain entry and enter there. Mm -hmm. Thirdly we have also noted that some of these uh, watchmen and home guards, uh, the guards that we have at night some of them have not been vetted, you don't know them. Okay. They are the ones who collude with, uh, with thieves to come and, and break them. At that time there are no lights on you, you try to go and uh, put on the alarm, it is not there. That way you become a target, okay. you'll be robbed. And, 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 and that the, my final call is, uh, let us, let, let, let us uh, go back to where we started, that is community policing. So that if you hear there is something in my home, you alert me. You cannot come and knock the walls and, and, and uh, break the, the walls of my house when my neighbor cannot hear. Even myself, I will hear. So if I hear and I call you, you'll be able to respond because you know that is so-and-so mm -hmm. calling for assistance. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Richard, there's people who are saying maybe it's time we considered carrying our own firearms to protect ourselves. Your thoughts? Uh, firearm is not a solution mm. because even carrying firearm will come with its own risk. Mm. Some of it will end up in uh, uh, okay. uh, criminals' hands and all that. Okay. So that is not the solution. And, uh, and Janet, if you look at what is happening in current currently, is uh, it is that there is enough benefit for the criminal's actions. The return is very high. And the probability of you being caught in current is low as compared to somewhere like Kibera. Mm -hmm. That's why you see now all criminals have realized that uh, the, 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 there is more benefit in current than it, there is in Kibera. And another thing is that you realize that these people are not networked at all. You, you, you saw that most of the people that are being attacked are just people who have just moved in the other day. They don't know each other. Mm. And these are the people, just like uh, uh, Ndolo has said, these are the people that should come together. In fact, what they need to do is to take advantage of the technologies that are there currently, mm -hmm. even using Twitters and all that, mm -hmm. so that, that they can be in a position to mobilize themselves very fast okay. wherever such an attack occurs. Very briefly, Twitter, as we wind up, mm -hmm. your views on how we can immediately begin to protect ourselves. Yes. I know we heard uh, Dr. Oscar Gidua give us a few, some, some insight into that. Your thoughts on some of the very crucial things we need to do immediately just to protect yes. ourselves as citizens. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one is that uh, we should consider being our neighbor's keeper. That is very important. We should also be conscious of our own security. Avoid things like Ndolo, what Ndolo said, routine things that it is known that Tuta will follow this route at this time with this car and he follows this route every day. Because nobody will ever attack you, Janet, before he's, he carries out a civilians against you. No one. 
two sometimes whenever an attack occurs you realize that that same victim is the one in one way or the other who may have exposed himself to such a risk there is some always some element of contribution on the part of the victim to that attack so these are the issues that we need to look at at individuals but we should not just say that the responsibility of protecting mm -hmm. the citizen is 100% on the police. That one will be wrong. All right. Yes. Thomas. Yeah, okay. I think uh, we are not saying the police uh, have the responsibility 100% protecting citizens. We have our part to do, which I'm sure we are doing. So, but the problem is many times the police think that uh, the citizens should protect themselves mm -hmm. and that could not be much of their work. I think it's good that they be reminded, that's my feeling, mm -hmm. that they have such a duty in their, as one of their roles. Okay, mm. he feels very strongly about that. Your final thoughts, I know you talked about the areas you've mentioned, but your final thoughts on how, how we can help you and the kind of help that you need as a department. Janet, uh, the very first one is um, mm. information sharing. Let the citizens share information with the police. However, how little it is, it can assist somewhere. Mm -hmm. Information sharing, very important. Assisting one another, very important. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody has been injured, usually by robbers, mm -hmm. and you don't assist, who assists? Mm -hmm. Who else? And you are nearer. Yeah. The other one is uh, we require support. Financial support always is required. Mm -hmm. I want to thank, to, thank, to thank the government for the vehicles that they released to the police. They have done quite a commendable job. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank members of public who have time and again mm -hmm. given police information okay. on, uh, about crime. Right. I want to thank them very much okay. and wish them uh, they continue the same. All right. Thank, thank you, you all uh, so much for your contribution. Yeah. Certainly a discussion that we'll need to have again because, like we said, it's a growing concern. We'll come back to specifics. Thank you very much. Uh, as you wind up, let's take a look at some of your feedback. Uh, before Hussein joins me very shortly, let's see what some of you have been saying on Twitter. If we can bring those up on the screens. That's right, we have at Puri and Jenga. If need be, get the army on the streets. Rwanda has done it and the whole country is very safe. Okay. At uh, Matundura 78, we need to deal with criminals. Uh, with an iron fist, Operation Operation Wembley in Uganda did it. It's time we thought about the safe style. At uh, Nakita Rivi says we need a complete overhaul of police, not transfers and intelligent officers uh, should always be in protective gears. Um, at Etiang Eli Amod says I think the government should work to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. Okay. Uh, and then we have at Motanya R says crime brings food on the table. Uh, income inequality and unemployment are the root causes of insecurity. At uh, face to keep, security should start from you and me and not shifting all the blame to the government. At Muko Bori, we invest very little in security as a country and expect too much. Indeed, it's a miracle how police manage. At uh, Paul Musili says, let the government deal with insecurity with the same passion it's doing with the wage bill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have at Eluko Sifuma says, hire highly qualified individuals into the police force and pay them well. The police are supposed to be the smarter ones. Let's take a look now at some SMSs. Yeah, on double two, four, double two. Uh, Felix from Nairobi says, let the IGP. Uh, Inspector General of Police operationalize his Directorate of Kenya Police Reservice and Community Policing. Mainstream police officers cannot be everywhere. Let him start recruiting KPR. Uh, somebody here says uh, police can't be everywhere. I think what they need is intelligence and maybe reservists can come in handy. Same issue. And this is interesting. My name is Ezekiel. What is disturbing me is during the late Honorable Michuki's era, there wasn't this, I won't say that word, but what he's saying. <laughs> a bit offensive but he's saying the issue of all vehicles having tinted windows you cannot know who is inside the tents should be scrapped completely don't know how many agree with that mm, interesting perspective there uh, well thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and views your own stories with us on Monday special 
We'll keep the conversation going, of course, on using the hashtag MondaySpecialKE. I'm Janet Bogwa. Stay safe and have a good night. Good night. I'm Hussein Mohammed.